You are watching the Pan African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want. Unity, consciousness, our culture, our spirituality, our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa. Wonderful. Greetings. Greetings to this entire community and family out here. Thank you. Thank you today for joining the Pan African Daily TV with Professor James Small and Dr. Susan Tata. Today we are going to be broadcasting um, particularly on uh, Joshua Maponga's page and other pages like when Professor James is live. It is mandatory, according to King Joshua Maponga, to stream live on his page from Harare, Zimbabwe. So I want to greet all of you that are joining this conversation, this team. It's been a while, a long while that we haven't had Prof here on the platform with us. And so it is an honor, an absolute honor to get in touch again, you know, with Professor James Small. Um, I think the last time that we met was at the Black Excellence Conference in New York. And uh, since that time, um, we haven't met again, you know, uh, like directly to carry on our conversations. So I want to thank all of you that are joining. If you're joining, please make sure you're just sharing the, this conversation. Because today we want to go back to our basics. We want to go back to the first thing that united us on the Pan-African Daily TV. We know a lot of things have been um, uh, have been going on with nearly every single topic that we're supposed to. And today we want to go back to remind ourselves on the basics of what is necessary. What should we focus on? What should be our at any time when we connect? When I in the diaspora, what should be our priority as Africans worldwide? So I want to thank all of you that are watching from Zambia, Jeremiah, Yoka, thank you my name, thank you for being here. Godwin, Amaya, and you know, Stacey is watching from South Africa. All right. Thank you. And uh, Donald is, I would love to travel to ghana you know when is the good time so prof is going to answer all these questions but today he wants to focus we want to talk about the cultural political economical uh spiritual unity of africans worldwide that is the basics of what unite us and that is what we want to talk about today in the next one or one and a half hours with you. One hour is very good to go. I hope all of you are doing well. And once more, again, solidarity with our people in the Sudan. The whole of this period, we're going to be thinking about our people in the Sudan. We're going to be praying and meditating and sending them the spiritual contact that we need. You know, we are saying, please get out of our land, get out of our continent, leave our people in peace. We want to live in peace and unity and love. That is our basic right. Our people have a right to stay in peace, enjoy their continent and their resources. Okay. So as you can see, Prof is sitting right here and grading younger every day. Younger every day. Professor James Small, <laughs> welcome to the conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Susan. I don't, <clears throat> I don't quite know about looking younger every day. But I'm looking at you having been to Cameroon, to Tanzania, to the U.S. You've been all around the world, and especially back home to the continent. And you're the one that's looking younger and younger. So I'm honored uh, to be back 
with Pan African Daily TV. It is still the most powerful network in the African world. And we have to make sure that its integrity is maintained and make sure that you are taken care of so that you can continue uh, this work. Uh, it's, it's just it's so extremely important that we have a communication platform that bring the best of the African minds to the air of the African people. And that's what you do. That's what Pan-African Daily TV does. And that's why you're so significant. And so I'm happy with my little mind to, to just be back. Um, there's so much happening in the world with our people and even here in the United States. You know, we have a lot of our young people who are ignorant of our history, um, ignorant of our struggle over the last 100 years. And they're going around um, speaking against Pan-Africanism. Um, uh, many are saying, we're not from Africa. Well, I'm waiting for them to tell me which moon in the universe they came from. Um, we understand that when the mind is colonized, when the mind is enslaved, the behavior of our children is what we see both in America and Central South America, the Caribbean, Europe, and on the continent. So PLO Lumumba have been talking very much lately about decolonizing African religion, decolonizing African culture, decolonizing African political power, decolonizing African economics. And really that had this topic today have to deal with those things, the economics, the politics, the culture, and the spiritual systems of Africa. You know, you can't say I'm free, but you curse and defame the gods of your ancestors. How, how does one say I'm free when I curse my ancestor? How do one say I'm free when I make a joke of my ancestor, right? Mm -hmm. Who can I love more than the love that I should have for my ancestors? And any people that have lost the contact to their ancestors have lost their freedom to someone else. And so this is an important question. It's not an easy one because of all of the invasions and just we'll deal just with the recent ones we won't deal with the persian invasion or the greek invasion or the roman invasion all of these are invasions over the centuries that incurred and entered our territory of africa and colonized us and enslaved us the greeks did it the romans did it the persians did it the assyrians did it and we defeated most of them and drove them out. And then we had the biggest and the longest invasion was the Arabs and then the Turks. <clears throat> that invasion lasted from 800 uh, AD until 1918, when the Turkish hold was crushed, but the damage was done. And then the Western European invasion, starting with the Portuguese in the 1400s, lasted till now with the Portuguese and the Germans and the Brandenburgs and the Swiss and, and the Dutch and the Spanish and the French and the British. That war against Africa still continues. We call it colonialism like it's... Uh, 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 how do you say? We refer to colonialism like it's a play at the theater or something that we're looking at. Colonialism is genocide. Colonialism is slavery. Colonialism still exists in many different forms. In Krumah, called the present form, the first president of independent Ghana, call it neo-colonialism meaning they will pull their troops out, but they will control our economics. They will control our culture. They will control our religion. 
They will control our education. They will thus control our minds. They will even tell us that their language should be the primary language and our indigenous language is secondary. Their languages are taught in the school and our indigenous languages are forbidden. And even though the, the Europeans have physically removed their armies, we are now enforcing these colonial genocidal programs on ourselves. Cultural genocide is as deadly as physical genocide. Economic genocide is as deadly as physical and cultural genocide. Political genocide is as deadly as economic, cultural, and, 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 and um, spiritual genocide. And if we don't get serious about being African, Af being African is more than a label. Afri being African is not a label. And we, we think and look at Africa, or it's not an aesthetic. We say, oh, if I wear some African clothes, if I put on a nice booba, and I wear a nice head wrap, or if I put on some nice African jewelry, or I wear a big Afro, I'm African. No, those are aesthetic that suggest that you're waking up to being conscious of what was taken away. But until we change our mind, until we cleanse our mind of the European mimetic ideation, and let me tell you what I mean by European, I don't wanna throw you, know, I'm not a big word person, right? European mimetic ideation is European cultural ideas that have now formed our consciousness and identify themselves as African ideas that's governing our behavior. So when we meet real African ideas, the European ideas within our mind pretending to be African rejects the authentic African ideas. European mimetic ideation. You got that? Okay. Let me go over that again. In the education of right. colonialism, yeah. Yes, ma'am. In the education of colonialism. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. You got it? And I, I want to restate it. When a colonizer or an enemy controls your socialization process, now your socialization process is how you get your values, your interests, and your principles. That means they control your education. They control what comes on television. They control the images in the movies. They control the images in the books. They determine what you should put up in a museum or what you shouldn't put in a museum. Uh, and when they control these instruments, these are the tools that socializes the human mind. And so what colonialism and its cultural genocide have succeeded in doing is supplanting an image of the African in the mind of the African that is really a European structure principally, culturally, and value-wise, but it is identifying itself as though it is African. So when mm. the African colonized mind meets an authentic African mind, the African colonized mind think the African they're pretending to be is under attack. Mm. And thus it fights against the authentication of being African within their own selves. Susan, you're looking at me like I'm, I'm not making sense. Am I making you're sense? Making, you? oh, no, you're making so much sense because, I mean, it, it, it <clears throat> comes out reasonably true and that's that's the point you know being what uh, king maponga calls being a coconut just brown mm -hmm. from the inside and white right. from the inside right. that's why so just go ahead because i'm loving the, the, the thing that's so painful is that the african or the african caribbean or the african american or the african latino and the african even on the continent the africans in europe those of us who possess this european value system disguised as African within our minds, 
don't know it. We think we're Africans. And yet when we are presented with a, like in Ghana, a good Christian Ghanaian, when he's presented with the image of Nana Parabia, may God bless his soul, the high priest of Latte, and those in Ghana know who I'm talking about, they will reject her as being evil. Yet Nana Parabia, the spirit of indigenous Ghanaian spiritual culture is a high priest of our spiritual culture. And even from her grave, she can still teach us how to rebirth ourselves as African people. Because we must, and we are right now in a rebirthing process, but we don't want to have, um, how do you say, we don't want to have malformed African babies. We want to have healthy African spiritual babies being born in this rebirthing process. We don't want to have a baby where half of the mind is European, the other part is Asian, and then a small piece that's aesthetic is African. We want the depth of the being that's being rebirthed to be African. Then we will determine what aesthetics is appropriate for us to display ourselves to the world. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I know this. I have a question. So <laughs> you were home. I have a, while a question. Ago. Huh? You were home in Cameroon. I don't know. Yes. And I saw some beautiful pictures of you and your mom and your sister and other women, and you were dressed so exquisitely. I was sending those pictures all over the world, all over my world, because you were displaying an African aesthetic that came from an authentic African consciousness. Yes. Now, we have to make sure when we see the African aesthetics that it is the presentation of the first contact of the authentic African consciousness. The African consciousness mm -hmm. says, I want my people free. The African consciousness says, I want to control my land for my generations to come. The African consciousness say, I will speak only an African language as the primary learning language of my society. Yes, I will learn English or Mandarin or any French, any other language that will help me in the world. But the language that I teach my ideas in, the language that teach me concept, ideas, and principles must be an indigenous African language because the concept, ideas, and principles of the African mm. spiritual mind is fundamentally different from the mind of our colonizers. And that's super important. We fought many wars. We fought wars with guns. We fought wars, and we've gained a lot. We've gained our land back, but we're losing control of our land economically because the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and now the Chinese economic system have come to put us in debtor slavery. So they put us in so much debt that we have to mortgage the raw materials of Africa to them for a hundred years to get out of a debt that we haven't bought anything with because what we bought was from the same person who put us in the debt, his inferior products. And we did not use the money to develop an African indigenous industry that will produce its own product. And then we've signed, we have presidents who have signed treaties that say, oh, you can build my port and we'll borrow the money from you and we'll give you all this gold or diamond or Col Colton or bauxite for 50, 60 years. 
And then we'll all say, you have the right to run my port in my country for the next hundred years. That is about as close to insanity as anyone can get. So it's either insanity or it is deliberate traitors who have collaborated with our new oppressors. Because this is not about being nice to anyone. This is about saving the African peoples from the systemic oppression using technocracy, technocracy and economics to dominate us like they used to use the gun. They don't need a gun now because they're in our heads with the technology. How can I have the gold in my ground, the coltan in my ground, the cobalt in my ground, the uranium in my ground, the diamond in my ground, and I'm poor. You have nothing in your ground, but your dollar is worth 10 times my dollar. But I have all the wealth in my ground. That's insane just on his face. And yet we accept it on a daily basis as normal. Oh, we say, oh, that's the way international economics work. We are part of the world economic system. No, we're not. We are the slaves in the world economic system. We are the oppressed in the world economic system. This is economic genocide that the G7 and others have sit and collaborated upon and carry out using many of our own people who they've taken to their lands, given the free education, given the master's degree in economics, given the PhD degree in economics and finances, and then those people come back home and run for presidents and prime ministers with the system of the enemy and the program of the enemy in their consciousness as the only way forward. And yet the reality is the same. The gold is in my land. The coltan is in my land. The cobalt is in my land. The bauxite is in my land. The manganese is in my land. The cocoa is growing in my land. But I'm walking around in poverty. The man who have none of these things, he flies in in his private plane. He drives in his fancy car. He stays at the five-star hotel, right? And we go and meet in the lobby in our suits, all over the lobbies all day long, signing away the life of our great-great-grandchildren yet to come. And we call ourselves diplomats and politicians. Now we have to raise some fundamental questions among the youth, and I'm speaking to the youth of Africa. This is your land, this is your wealth being squandered. What are you going to do? There are ways to remove these people. You have electoral political systems. You can vote them out of office, but you must first organize yourselves for the purpose of building a better Africa. You've got to say, I want a better Africa and to get that better Africa, yes, I can leave and I can go to America and I can get a good job, but I can send money back home. I can go to Britain or Germany or France and I can make money and I can send it back home, but that will not save Africa. Only your mind being determined to stay in Africa, to organize yourself as young Africans, to remove the impotent leaders from office and to put in office those who you chose and who you tutor to serve your interests <clears throat> in international politics and international e economics and to reestablish the culture of our ancestors with integrity in the land of our ancestors. So let's look at culture. We'll just go back. That was like this introduction, right? Thank you. What is culture, what are we talking about? Culture is all the things that people do, right? But what mm -hmm. makes it peculiar is how they do it and why they do it. So everybody have a different way for how to do it and why they do it. Culture is the food people eat. Everybody eats food. 
But everybody don't prepare food the same way. Everybody don't eat the same food at the same time of the year. Everybody don't present their food to their systems spiritually in the same way. So what is the African food? Don't tell me I'm going downtown Lagos or or, um, uh, to, I'm going to Zanzibar or I'm going to Lome and I'm gonna find the French restaurant. Hey, no, say I'm going to find an in restaurant that serve indigenous African cuisine. We have 54 nations. Within those 54 nations, we have a couple of thousand ethnic nations, each one with a cuisine. We would eat for the next 500 years and not run out of a peculiar African cuisine. So why am I looking for some French cuisine in the middle of Africa, right? Let me see the beauty of varying African cuisines in all areas from seafood to vegetables, to meat products, to how we present and serve. You know, a lot of food has to do with the aesthetic presentation of the food itself. And then to do with the nutrients, why we eat this food in the morning, why we eat this food in the noontime, why we eat this particular food at night, why we eat this food in the springtime, why do we eat this food in the wintertime? Why do we eat this food in the rainy season, but we eat this food in the dry season? All of these things is determined by the culture of a people through the knowledge, behavior, and habits that the ancestors have developed over centuries upon centuries of centuries of presenting this food item to itself. That's just food, right? That's just one piece of culture. Our concept of science studying cosmology, studying ecology, studying the human anatomy, studying the animals in the environment, studying our relationship to them. All of this is what makes up your culture. We have a different view of all of these things, we meaning the African, than anybody else in the world. They all have their differing view, for better or for worse, but it's not ours. So we must recapture our view. I started to wear a piece of kente cloth today, right? And we look at the kente cloth. No one mm-hmm. has been able to duplicate the weaving. They can make, you know, copies, prints of kente, but no one has been able to yet duplicate the weaving of the kente. Thank God we still have that sacred science in our minds. And I remember an occasion in the Kinti village in, in, in Ghana some years ago with two men and a woman. I won't say what country they were from. They were there to study how Kinti is made. And they were trying mm-hmm. to convince the leadership that they were going to write a book about Kinti. And it was going to make the Kinti village very famous. So I challenged this when I arrived in town that morning. And of course, they said, well, who are you? You some old American, how you? This is what the Europeans were saying to me. But before the day was done and after a good fist fight and everything was settled and the police and the intelligence people interviewed everyone, they decided to kick them out of the village because in any other part of the world, this would be called industrial espionage. Okay, industrial espionage. And the Asafo company of that village sent me their flag and their blessing acting as an asafo on that day. Because Kinte, as I was taught by the elders in the metaphor, one day one hunter was going through the forest, the rainforest, and he had so many spider webs and he would tear them down and he's going hunting. But every time when he on his way back home, the spider had redone his web. And he's got to tear the web down again to get home with his catch for today so he can have dinner. So at the last web, he stopped and he asked the spider, how do you get to do this? How do you, I just tore your spider web down and now you've rebuilt the spider web again and you blocked my path again to get home. 
So the spider sat him down and told him how he made the web, the spider's web, and how they could do it so quickly and why it was so strong. So when this man got back to his village, he tells the other chiefs. And so they took the idea of the spider and they use it to weave the kente. So the kente is Anansi's web, you know. And so no one can find that secret except in the head of Anansi's people who have the, 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 the methodology from Anansi itself. So things like that in our culture is important to understand because it may seem frivolous at first, but when you really see what we have done, it is an extraordinary cultural thing. And each kente, today we see people wearing the kente prints and some wearing kente that was just made in, in a small village to sell to tourists. But most of the major kente cloth that's made is only one of a kind and they're made for royalty only. So you'll find this one is for this king and those designs never going to be duplicated again. And then this one is for this queen mother and those designs will never be duplicated again. That's a cultural thing that we need to understand, just dealing with, with fabric. But if we deal with the culture of what is the relationship between the moon and the human being. How does African and culture, interp culture interpret that? What is the relationship between the constellation, the Big Dipper or Cassiopeia, they call the other one, and their position in the sky to the human being at any time of year? Or what is the relationship to the constellations, the sun and the moon, to planting different kinds of crops in different parts of the land at different times of the year? When we weave all of this together, into a social blanket, then we are looking at the scientific interpretation of African culture in relationship to cosmology and ecology. And out of that comes the philosophy that governs our daily behavior or what we call our sacred science or our spiritual system. So we have to return to our way. And if modern times, we live in a modernity, if you wanna write it down like others wrote, our things down and some of their own and call it this holy book and that whole, then write it down. But it's up to you to rediscover how our ancestors saw the universe, to rediscover how our ancestors saw nature, to rediscover how we saw the relationship between our health and food. We did not wait for someone in a university in Boston, Massachusetts, or in, in France to tell us how, what diet is. We were delivering babies before anyone else in the world were delivering babies and cutting biblical and biblical cords on babies. So we know gynecology, we know um, pediatrics, all of these things are a part of our sacred culture and science. Let's rediscover them and then modernize them. Many of them have already been modernized. You need simply to find a relationship to modernity and your ancient traditions and bridge them so that you can remember who you were before this time. So you can then celebrate yourself. And celebration is simply a reminder of who you used to be and who you want to continue to be in your new time, in your new space. So we need to get serious about culture. Music is a significant part of culture, but what is music and why is music and what types of music and why do we make different types of music? There's music that heals the human body. There's music that can cause trauma in the environment that can change the weather. There's music that can soothe the mind and bring it into a meditative state to help it heal its inner self. There's all kinds of music. How do we again discover the music in our culture and the purpose for that music? An elder once taught me that all content have intent. All content have intent. Our music as content 
have peculiar intents. Let's rediscover those intents so we could do more to our music than the um, piano dance shaking our hips and wiggling our legs. There's more to our music than that. When we show, and I'm watching on the TikTok all the time, where they'll show African rites of passage to the girls only to show their breasts bouncing up. Rites of passage is about more than wiggling your breast in a dance. Let's talk about what is rites of passage? What is initiation? What are we initiating you into? What are we passing you forward to? And why? All of this is in our culture already. We don't have to invent it. We have to study our ancestors. And you can't study them if you don't respect them. And you can't respect them if you have the way of life of those who set out to kill them. Those who set out to destroy them have planted themselves in your mind so that now you will destroy your own ancestors. So you will now destroy your past in your own mind so you can't profit from your beautiful culture. So you can't learn from your beautiful culture. So you can't fortify your beautiful babies against the enemy's cultural pollution. Yes, the enemy's cultural pollution. You must use African culture to fortify your babies against that. And so culture guides and protects a society from genocide. And your culture is protected by your politics. Your politics is your management system. But before we get to the politics, let's go back to the economics. Economics comes from the word, you see, echo from the word ecology. The things in your ecology and your environment that you give wealth to and you process for use by you ends up making what you call your economics. Well, economics is the wealth in your environment then, in your ecology. But what is your politics? Your politics is the management system that protects that wealth from being taken away from you by others. Unfortunately, our politics is doing just the opposite. It's giving our wealth away to others instead of protecting our wealth for the future of our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. So when we are no more, we have assured them that they will always be. But you have to have a polity, a politics that has the responsibility to manage the interests of the economy of the people who is defined by the culture of their ancestors. Then you're whole because it is your culture that helps you establish your identity. And Dr. Asa Hilliard says, true freedom only exists when you are shackled to your identity. When you are shackled to your identity, then you have true freedom. So when you come and say, oh, I'm part British and I'm part Igbo. No, make a choice because then nobody else in the world but you see you as part British and part Igbo. All the British see you as Igbo. And that's the only world you will live in unless you're going to pretend to live in there. So stop pretending. I say I'm an African-American, but I'm clear. Africa is my race. America is a geopolitical place. I live in this geopolitical place. I work in this geopolitical place, but that is not my race. That is not my culture. That is not my spiritual science. That is not my spiritual center. My spiritual center is indigenous African understanding of my relationship to cosmology and ecology. And what I want to call the forces, the Orishas, or the Obosum, or the Loas, or the Netarus, however I break down the pieces of the one so that I can have a greater understanding of the whole, as long as it comes from an African crucible, I will drink from that cup. I will drink from that cup. I can live anywhere in the world because we, the Africans, we created the world. We populated everywhere in the world before any other mutation of ourselves came along with their swords and their guns 
to take it away from us. There is no history of any significance that show Africans going anywhere in the world killing people to take land from them. But everywhere in the world, the other mutants, if indeed they have mutated off of our gene pool, have come with their guns and their swords and forced us to take their language and rape our women for centuries, not a day, not a week, not like they did in Germany where they had their Holocaust for five or six years. Ours lasted 500 years, 1500 years, 2000 years. You know how unimaginable that is? When you have not been in control of yourself significantly for more than 2000 years, where another person who you treat as friend and brother in the world have been practicing genocide of overview and then lying about you even being human. They don't even want to call you a human being because then that they can't rationalize the genocide that has propelled them out of the envy, the jealousy, the greed, the hatred and the violence that they've wreaked upon us for the sake of controlling the wealth in the ground that we live upon. And so we have to get control of the economics, the politics, and the culture of Africa. And we must guide it with the sacred science or spiritual system or indigenous African religion, whatever you want to call, to ensure there's a future for our great children and our great great grandchildren. And that means you must study history. You must understand colonialism. Colonialism was not a friendly um, relationship that we had with the monarch of the UK. Colonialism was a process where the monarch of the UK was murdering and robbing African people to bring the wealth that we just saw displayed with the anointing of a king in the UK uh, the other day. I personally didn't watch it. I don't want my ancestors to feel insulted through my eyes. So I would not put things in my eyes that will insult my ancestors that sit inside of me. I hope I'm getting through. Uh, Sometimes people say I'm too harsh. And yet the same people that say, oh, no, the truth, the truth is the light. God is the light, God is the truth. So if your God is the truth and your God is the light, first study the truth of history. It will show you the light to return back to your African mind very quickly if you're willing to do that. But the steps we must take, we have some of the best universities in the world in Africa. We have some of the best professors in the world, male and female in Africa. We have some of the best botanicals in the world in Africa. Let's organize ourselves so that there's a partnership between the university, there's a partnership between the botanicals, there's a partnership between the hospitals. There's a partnership between those who are trained to be doctors to build a medical system in Africa that none of our people will ever have to get on a boat or a plane to go anywhere outside of Africa for treatment, for anything. Some of the best African doctors live in the United States. Why is that? Some of the best doctors out of Ghana train in Ghana best doctors out of Nigeria, train in Nigeria, the best doctors out of Cameroon now live in France or England. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. The best doctors out of Angola lives in Portugal. So let's create a system where those people who must offer the critical services to our community can remain in our countries. Otherwise, Africa will never grow unless we can take care of the health of our people. Let's tell anyone that wants a contract, you want a contract, you want to buy some bauxite, fantastic. We got plenty of bauxite to sell you. We got plenty of manganese to sell you. Oh, we got plenty of coltan to sell you. But you must build the processing plant in Africa. You must build the processing plant in Africa so my people can work. And then secondly, we must have time to 
when your technicians who are training my people to run the facility leave my country. And that time certainly should be no longer than 10 years at the max. For most of the training, it can be five years. Then leave us and we'll send you our finished product. And you can sell and make your money. And we would have employed our people and made our money. And we can continue to go forward in peace. But if Africa isn't ready, the youth of Africa isn't ready to take control of the economics of Africa by a, a new industrialization process that is informed by African culture and values, you're not going to ever be free. You'll be slaves for eternity. Colonialism was genocide and slavery. Colonialism is still genocide and slavery. Colonialism still exists in every corner of Africa, just like slavery still exists in the Caribbean and in and, and North America. You think we're free because they put us on a TV show and tell you, oh, we got this black millionaire, Miss Oprah. We got this black movie maker. We're slaves in America. And ever we try to be Africans and project African culture, we come under attack from every aspect of the system, including other black people. You can prosper in America as long as you'll be a white person in black face. But you try to be an African in America and you will be killed like a Malcolm X and a Martin Luther King and Matt Gavis and so many others whose names we don't know. So let's stop lying to ourselves. Let's tell ourselves the truth. If we don't get control of the economic, which is controlling the wealth in your ecology, the politics, which is the management interest, instrument for that wealth, the culture at the core, which is your spiritual system, which gives the politics its ethical and moral barometers, then you will never free Africa. You can bring all the money you want. You will never free Africa. We hear that some of the, the largest billionaires in the world are Africans and they're living in Nigeria. Show us the fruit of your tree. You go to the church of those who've committed centuries of genocide. You go to the mosque of those who committed centuries of genocide. You desecrate the indigenous history. You desecrate the indigenous shrine. You use your television now and your video to make mockery of African indigenous institutions and then say you want to be free. Free to be what? If you're going to be free, you must become free to be the indigene that you used to be. If you're not caught being free to become the indigene that you used to be, then you're only being free to continue the Euro-colonialism of the mind of the African, which then is the Euro-colonialism of the environment that that mind will create. You can only create what your mind can design, and your mind will only design what is in its best interest. And if, you're best, if your mind is European, its best interest is not to design in Africa for the Africans at home and abroad, as Garvey once said. So how do we best use the university? How many of our school systems on the continent of Africa, how many of them, just at the most basic level, when the children are dressed, they're wearing cloth that's made in Africa of African design, or they're wearing the bland one, two solid color representing the flag of the European who had conquered us at that time, or the European church that led in the conquest of our minds so that the European army could conquer our bodies. So when are we going to just take that basic step? Okay. When are we going to say that the African child must know more about African history than it does about the colonialist history? How can we say we're free if we don't know our history? Anybody who says they're free and they can't stay here and tell you their history, going back hundreds of years, you've got a slave pretending. But they can tell you what Wilberforce did. They can tell you what 
King James did. They can tell you what the head of the Brandenburgs did. They can tell you what the people who built St. Petersburg did. They can tell you what the people who built the Vatican did, but they can't tell you who built the, the Benin Wall. They can't tell you who built the pyramids of Nigeria. Okay? They can't tell you who built Great Zimbabwe. They can't tell you who built Manamatapa. They can't tell you who built the great civilization uh, of, of Kush. You know? They don't even know of a Lalibela. And we go on and on. So there shouldn't be a school in Africa where African history isn't at the top of the curricula. Why are we still teaching a colonial curricula when we say we're independent and free? Why do we still have 54 colonial slave plantations calling them countries when we say we're free? Why don't we have a united Africa, one country? Instead of having 54 people negotiating with these mighty Western nations around things economic, political, and cultural, and losing in all of our negotiations, why don't we have one negotiating team that negotiates for all of Africa, that is representative of all of Africa? Then OAU would have some or what's the, the African Union would have some credibility. Right now, the African Union is nothing more than a celebratory um, institutions that do political ceremonies a few times a year. They can't speak up to tell the West, stop the genocide in Haiti. You know, we can't speak up to tell the uh, Zambia, that the Chinese cannot have this kind of control of any state institution and apparatus in Africa. We can't tell South Africa that you will close all the Chinese police stations you have in South Africa. That is inappropriate. It is an insult to the integrity of African peoples. Either our politics is going to reflect the interests of the people, which is defined by the culture of the people, which is learned from the history of the people. Or it's not our politics at all that we're seeing. It's the politics of the colonizers in blackface. Some a little more radical than others in how they're gonna manage the colonizers business, but nobody's talking about managing the African business. We're managing the colonizers business. As rich as Ghana is, I go with one little petty US dollar that's not backed by anything except a printing press. And Ghana with all this gold and diamond and cobalt and everything else, your dollar is worth nine, nine of your dollars worth one of mine. Yet I have nothing to back mine. That doesn't make no sense. And it's worse than other countries. And it makes no sense. African, you sit by and you let the Americans declare Zimbabwe, persona non grata, to sanction Zimbabwe and you respect those sanctions. There is not a, there is not a court based on human beings that would have granted anyone the right to sanction Zimbabwe because they wanted to be free from the enslavers. And yet, you sit quietly. You African mighty freedom nation with your pretty flag and your nice national anthem that you sing. And you have not said, no, Zimbabwe will not die. No, Zimbabwe will not fall because not a single African nation will support a sanction against Zimbabwe. And if Zimbabwe needs rice, we will send them rice. If Zimbabwe needs wheat, we will send wheat. If Zimbabwe needs mechanics, we will send mechanics. No. You acted like a bunch of slaves being told what to do by your slave master, colonizers and imperialists abroad. And you call yourself free. That is not free economics. That is not free politics. That is not free culture. That's slavery and colonialism. It's not even neo-colonialism. That's just straight out colonialism. 
So how do we use young people? This is young Africa. People like me, I'm going to be dead in a few years. If I get that much time, I'm praying for a few more years. But if I don't get the few more years, I've done the best work I can do. But for you, the youth of Africa, wherever you are, whether you're in France or England or Germany or America or Jamaica or Trinidad or Venezuela or Colombia, wherever you are, or Brazil, that's your Africa. And you have a responsibility to save her and to build her and to see that she's thriving and not allow her to sink back into slavery and colonialism again. That's your job. And you can't do that job if you don't understand the relationship between economic politics and culture and you don't understand the need to understand how the African sacred science, what we call spiritual system, penetrates all three of those things. So I've got a lot of phones that sometimes distract me. So I hope Ms. Susan is still here. Um, I think we can say that Africa will only survive if the youth of Africa begin to understand the relationship between the wealth of Africa and the value that's placed on the currencies of Africa. We cannot any longer allow the currencies of African nations to be determined by these impoverished Western nations that have no wealth to back their currencies or allow our leaders to sign contracts giving us false indebtedness to International Monetary Fund and the World Bank that then handcuff the next generation to pay debts that they never had real capital to build anything with. So you got to really study this. And I'm not anti, I live in America, I'm not anti-West. I'm anti-criminality. I'm anti-injustice. I'm anti-unfairness. I'm anti all of those things that take advantage of African peoples anywhere in the world, even if you're in blackface. <clears throat> and a lot of the people that, that we have to fight against are in blackface. So you cannot build Africa unless you're clear about the economic politics and culture that is the undergirt. You cannot understand economic politics and culture unless you understand the history that have brought us to this date. What has that history been? And how can that history inform me? You cannot rebuild Africa unless you have a respect beyond measure for the ancestors whose history you're now referencing. Even those who say, oh, we are Christian, which is the majority of our continent, nearly, you say, honor thy mother and thy father that your days may be long upon the land. Well, your ancestors is your mothers and your fathers, your great mothers and your great fathers. How can you say in your religion to honor them and in your daily goings and comings, you totally disrespect them? So we must really understand what culture means. Culture means to cultivate the best of your ancestors' ideas. Cultivate the best of your ancestors' thoughts. Cultivate the best of your ancestors' technology. Cultivate the best of your ancestors' understanding of cosmology and ecology. Cultivate the best of your ancestors' spiritual interpretation of reality. See, the best. And when you do that, because the word culture, of course, comes from the word to cultivate. And so when you do that, you realize that there's an African in you that can defeat the European in you pretending to be an African in you. Say it again. When you do the right thing, you will develop an African in you that will defeat the European in you pretending to be an African in you. Again, again, Prof, say that again. <laughs> when you do what I said, learn history, learn culture, you will develop an African in you. An African in you is what you will develop. You will be rebirthing. 
And that African that you give rebirth to through studying your history will defeat the European in you, the pretending to be the African in you. It's a psychological game. It is psychological warfare. They've played it so well that we are prisoners and think we're running around the field free. The field is just an illusion. You're in a cell chained to the corner. When you realize you're chained to the corner, you'll break the chains and you'll tear down the walls of the cells. But if you're under the illusion that you're running around in a field free, you will never break the chain and you will never tear down the walls. Does that make sense, Miss Susan? So much sense, Professor James Moore. Yes. So, so you should ask questions. Sometimes we don't leave enough question time. So I would surely entertain a question. Okay. Because it's so simple. And we can take I some calls. We can also cool. take some calls. There are also questions in the chat. Sorry. Hmm. Well, I was saying, if I say I love Susan Tata, how would that get interpreted? There's an African way to interpret that. And there's a European way mm -hmm. to interpret that. Right? Mm -hmm. Whose mm -hmm. value system is going to interpret my words when I say I love Susan Tata? I love Dr. Susan Tata. Now, which value system is going to determine what I'm saying? Which belief system is going to determine what I'm saying? African, Ubuntu. Absolutely. And I guarantee you, they will both come up with different answers or motivation. They will not understand how, when I look at you, I see my daughter, I see my wife, I see my sister, I see my mother, I see the universal love of the African female queen, goddess, king. I see all those things in you. And so I want to train myself to treat you as I'm approaching you, like all of those things should be treated. You understand? Correct. Okay. Perfect. Um, it, it's 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 very interesting, and most of the time, Prof, because you're here, we just sit and listen because we want to learn. I know that uh, my voice is delayed. There's a delay, uh, but I hope all of you can hear me. I want to appreciate all of you that are listening and learning, and your comment, your greetings to Prof, and um, all the confirmations that you're making in the chat. Absolutely, we are getting it, we see it, we read it, we we are with you. But we didn't just want to distract this topic because it's a very important one. The uh, For those that are joining late, the topic today is the political, cultural, economical, spiritual of our African essence and unity. And this is the basics of what Prof has been talking about today. How do we go back to these basics? We go back to these basics by reminding ourselves every day about the essence of our values. Like he said, we cultivate, we cultivate the same value chain systems of our ancestors, of our queen mothers, of our kings, of our spirituality, of our secret science, of knowledge and so all recultivating is more than just wearing an african dress pretending to be one but we are just coconuts <laughs> so i think the basics today and it's a whole training prof you agree with me if you can imagine most of the times we have to remind ourselves and um of course the idea now is getting hooked up with the continentals that's what most people think but i can guarantee you that it is about the mindset whether you are in the diaspora or on the continent if you don't get your mind straight on who you are on those values 
that pertain to us. You can be on the continent and you are just doing some foolishness more than any other person. But the advantage you have is you have a lot of family around you, everything around you, community around you, your village around you. You see the same people every day, the children and everything. That's just the difference. But if it comes to the mind of the African that you want to be, look at the products we sell. Look at the values we, we stand for. Look at the gatherings, what we say, what we do, what we eat. Look at the promotion, how we promote others more than us. You know, everything. So the Africa is within us, the one Africa. And it is upon each and every one of us to cultivate, like Prophet is saying, cultivate. Continue to remind yourself at every instance, at every circumstances, at every occasion, on every event, that yes, we can mingle, we belong to one world system, but every culture and nation has their own supply chain, global system. And they are tapping into the knowledge of their ancestry. They are tapping into the knowledge, into the innovation of their own culture, and they uphold and uplift these values. What about you? Over to you, Prof. I think that's just what we we <clears throat> needed to keep reminding ourselves. Like you said, that's the basic and the essence. Correct? Right. You know, there should be a day where every African around the world take that day for the African New Year. New Year means the beginning. We know the Ethiopians has probably got the oldest one. So they say, but it may be that the Cameroonians got the oldest one. What is the Cameroonian New Year? Not our West, not the Western Mess, not January one. That I'm not talking that stuff. Uh, in every one of our culture, we have a date that our ancestors said was the beginning time. We need to study these things. When is the beginning time among your ethnic nation? I bet you don't even know it, Susan. When is the beginning time? And 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 in Ghana, if I say I am Nana Kofi Mpansa, I'm from the kingdom of Agogo and Ashanti. I'm I'm the Akwapim, Agumu, Ash uh, Akan, Ashanti people. And we say there's an occasion where our people came out of a hole in the earth that the earth opened up and we just walked out. Now that's a metaphor, right? But let's study the metaphors our ancestors left us because with that metaphor is a date and time certain. When they said, this is when we established the recognition of ourselves as being. If we go to ancient Kemet, we'll read in uh, uh, the papyrus of Unas, um, the, 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 the pyramid text, where the African says in the beginning existed noon, the black waters, and out of her rose Amun, the first manifestation of God. And beside Amun stood Ma'at, the, 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 the symbol of femininity in the universe, which the West call Eve and Amun they call Adam. And so, we have these stories, it's in our culture, and there are these dates. They should be at least for the three, for the four seasons that much of the world go celebrate, and we are scattered all around the world, at least one major African holiday for each of the four seasons that all Africans stop everything and celebrate together on that day. Do you know the power with nearly 3 billion people stopping the world? Four times a year. The world will be very clear. We're dealing with a power we better not fool with. Because they can stop us four times a year and the world has to stop for them. And we can mm -hmm. celebrate our ancestors on whatever that occasion is, four times a year. Just that. Four major mm -hmm. holidays. 
in between, in our village, in our town, in our homes, there's an ancestor we can revere on any given day. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to the continent, that's what they did. Each of the day mm -hmm. of the week is named for an ancestor. But not just an ancestor, but a quality and attribute in nature. So in each of our homes, I think we can be there that question. on any given day. Okay, there's a question coming in, Professor James Small. Uh -huh. All right, just, just just go ahead, Prof. Prof is listening. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay, I want to say thanks to Prof. Thanks to him. Yeah, it, it's a very interesting discussion indeed. And uh, thanks to you also. Just the question I have is, since 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 the political uh, arena, the p political uh, arena is it, it, not going to change. How would you advise the young persons now to prepare themselves to take over to, to you know to, to go into that trend? As my, as my, 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 and so on. Yeah. Thank yes. you very much. Okay. Thank you. That, that's a good question. Every nation have a political process by which they elect their leaders. And every nation have in written form how that process works. So for instance, if I took, I'll, I won't take the United States, I'll take say Ghana. There's a methodology on what one has to do to be prepared to run for office. It's written down, it's the law. There's a methodology that what one has to do to start a political party. It's the law, it's written down. There's a, there, there are methods and, and training on how to carry on a political campaign. But we must first understand what is the geography of the country? What is the ethnic makeup of the country? What is the economic interest in each of the geographical space in the country? What is the ethnic, the relationship between the ethno-religious divisions in the country? We need to study ourselves and get to know ourselves and then study the history that produced the condition, at least go back a hundred years in studying history that produced the current condition that we are faced with. So if I was in Ghana, I would worry about, I would look at the various regions. If I look at the central region and the Western region, I'm looking at mostly fishing industry. If I'm looking um, at the Volta region, uh, along the Volta river and the Ashanti region, I'm looking at major farming industries. If I go to the Northern region, I'm looking at major cattle raising, farming like corn and wheat, and sheep raising region. And then I'm looking at the different industry where the bauxite, like um, Valcor is outside of Tema. I'm looking at where the harbor, we must study the, the, ge the geopolitical structure of our nation. We need to know who it is we want to represent. And then we need to study the history of the nation. How did we get to this point? How did we get here? Say over the last 50 years, the last, I say 100 years, you could do the last 50 years. How did we get here? in 50 years, okay? And, that, and what do we have here? Where's the wealth in the country? Who controls that wealth in the country? What institutions have been developed? Who's controlling those institutions? What is the educational construct? Colleges, trade school, technical schools, junior high schools, high schools, where are they located? And those things, so when we speak, come before our people to speak, we can tell them about their condition because the average people is too busy working to know these things. So we could go and inform them of things they had no idea is happening to their lives. They know something is happening to their lives, but we need to be able to study the country, study the laws, study the processes and be able to inform our people this other things happening to you that's causing your conditions to be what they are. 
Now let's come together in an organized manner to change them. Let's pick someone from among us, not support someone from the political party, A, B, or C. Let's pick someone from among us and let's groom them to run for political office to represent us. And let's learn that process so that we can successfully move them from our village discussion to the political seat we want them to be. And when we do that, we will have in place a process to hold them accountable. If you vote against the interests of the people, we will have a process to remove you from office. Those are the preliminary steps. Sounds easy and doable. It is doable. The others are using it very well against us. We need to learn to use it in our best interest for ourselves. Well, was there another question? Okay, no. <laughs> I I try to check the check uh, the the chat community here if there are questions in the chat or you know how to call okay. just like uh, our brother Lawrence called and um, you know the thing that I'm saying like we have an upcoming event um, but let we have an upcoming event in Germany yes, and um, we'll talk about this that. event we've been doing this event for long for more than 20 years and we continue to do this event because even when we started this event i'm talking going back to the point where you said most of us regardless of um where we are we are still having colonized mind and i can guarantee you when we started the event exactly we do things we did things that we were not conscious about but the one big thing that I know, and even on the continent today, is that natural ubuntu -ness in us. Thank God. Thank our ancestors that that one would never leave us. The things that we learn, of course, is part of what characterizes our minds. But if I look, even through the research that I did, even when I go on the continent, you can still see that at the end of the day, no matter how much our minds are being distorted. I'm talking about our culture. There is that natural melanin, that natural ubuntu that natural Africanness, that mm -hmm. still pulls us and we do things even unconsciously. You know, when I ask a lot of questions to my mothers, to my village uh, mothers, to my sisters, and I watch the steps and I watch the dynamics on the continent, most of the things that the continentals of us or us do is not a conscious thing, but it's a natural process in, in, into us from our ancestry. It is there. The act of us, co uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, coming together, share together, eat together, commune together. When, when there is a situation, we all come together. Honestly, that is not European. If, if we think that even when we learn a lot and we become that, I only beg to disagree that some of the things that are in our genes, in our DNA, is part of us. And we do it whether we are conscious or not. It's just there. How I behave, how I greet, how I relate to my own people, how I have the feeling that I belong how I have the feeling that I am empty without my family, without my people, without my continent. Even if I came for a purpose or I came on a journey or to look for food or to look for some other things, but at the end of the day, there is this thing in us that is untaken away, that can never, that can never be diluted. How I meet Professor James Moore how we just fit in New York. Have I not seen each other? Had I met brother Paul Brown? How we just connected as we knew ourselves. It's the same that thing. When I was in Tanzania, I mean, it was like we had met ourselves for thousands of years. There never was something like, I am a Cameroonian being in Tanzania or something else. 
on the street, people look at me and like, you resemble. And I remember one day when Mama Bello, Professor uh, Baina Bello said it here. She goes to Nigeria in Yoruba land and neighbors call her and they're speaking to her in the dialect because they see her as a neighbor. So I think one of the biggest things that we should celebrate when we come together and we should organize of the celebrations because one thing that would separate us, one thing that would actually tear us apart is when we adopt the system of not coming together. And I do understand how challenging it is. I do understand how we are fighting the demons in us through the systematic take away of our time through jobs, take away of our time that we don't even have a minute to breathe, to sit together to hold a conversation without thinking about how much dollars am I having? How much this? By most of the time when we will get back to the knowledge of what is more important that connects and unite us, when we meet like we met in, in New York, like we're going to meet in, 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 in Tübingen, Germany, like we meet in all the spaces that we belong in, I think that energy that Ubuntuness, that Africanness, that keeps pulling us, that pull system in us, is something that no matter we go to all sat of universities and have every, every degrees that we have, when I still see Professor James Moore, I know it is me. When I still see any other person that is me, I know this is me. And I think that is worth being Africanist, that is what the power that we have to remind ourselves every day. That is what, no matter how we have been fought from the spirituality level to tear us apart, when we meet, we still have that knowledge of recognizing that even though something might have happened, even though some, some they, there's something that might have interrupted, but the basics are still there. I see that flow. I felt that flow with the continent that even though they stay going to uh, the churches, even though they're still building is something, but there's just something in them that is a natural pull. And that natural pull can never be taken away, would never be taken away. We must accept that. We must agree to that. We must continue to solve that. We must continue to give as much as we can. We must continue to contribute as much as we can. Not only financially, should be the least, but the togetherness. And I love and I wish I could gather the whole of us to meet June 1st to the 4th in Turin, Germany. But I know that the few of us, we call ourselves few, is the multitude of the energy of the millions in our genes. So even just the physicality of us wanting to always be, if the spirit, like you say, and the right mind is clear, I think nothing can stop us. Am I correct, Prof? Well, you are well, absolutely, just... you are absolutely uh, correct. It's about that concept of being shackled to your identity. Um, I'm Professor Small. That's a name that my mother gave me, James Small, because I had an uncle, a granduncle named Mr. James Small. Um, mm. And he had a father named Mr. Peter Small. And then we don't know the name of the African man that he came from, but this is now back to the early 1800s. So mm -hmm. I'm not just James Small, I am all of them. Yes. I am all of them. And my six children, it's me. They're, they're aspects of me going forward. What is contained in them is the totality of what's contained in me, which is the totality of what was millions of ancestors. So when I follow the protocol of having an ancestral 
shrine in my home, and I do, and I've had as long as I can remember, and all of my children had to establish one in their home so that we can constantly wake up the ancestors in us because we are the very ancestors we pour the libations to. And then one day, when I'm no longer here, my daughter mm. and they're me pouring the ancestors' uh, uh, libation to themselves as me. You know, um, there's all we pour libation to daddy, to remember daddy when daddy's gone, but they're remembering themselves because I live in them. When me and Carol gave birth to them, we gave birth to ourselves. When our parents gave birth to us, they gave birth to themselves. That's African culture. If mm. we remember that, we will stop betraying that. See, we're betraying that now. Mm -hmm. We think we're separate, different being. I am the same African man that was in that book, the Pyramid Text, Amen, when he realized himself to be. I am Amen who realized himself to be. I'm his child. And as a child, I contain mm -hmm. the totality of his being. You are Ma'at. That first feminine energy manifests. That's still, she's still here. She's you. So if they establish an order of rightness in the world, then it's our duty to maintain that order of rightness in the world against mm -hmm. any force that comes to create a disorder in the world. A force have created a disorder in the world and then have created a disorder in the African mind to maintain their disorder in the world. And so the African must restore its mind through restoring its ancestral integrity to again create order in the world. It's a big deal. It is. Returning and rebirthing the African consciousness. The African mm. consciousness is the consciousness of the universe itself. Mm. But you won't know that unless you go there. You know, I, I, I've said on your show before that our sister, um, who was the anthropologist here in America, um, she said to be there, you must go there. But to go there, you must know there. Mm. To be there, you must go there. But to go there, you must know there. To be yes, in the mountain. Yeah ancestors, you really must know there in order to go there. That's why mm. history is essential. Our history, from our people's perspective, is essential mm. to establish the African personality as dominant in the consciousness of the African being, both politically, economically, and culturally. Mm. No way that if you want victory. Anything else is Dominance, poverty, and oppression. Poverty. Poverty. Mm -hmm. you, thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Prof. And um, I'm, I'm seeing the chat. It is very, very warm. And um, I mean, apart from just the teaching, um, the, the practice, the practice of, of what we do here every day, I mean, like, we listen to the to, to the lectures, but we are already communing in that spirit of oneness. And mm -hmm. so, if I look like in the chat, everybody that is uh, uh, the, the the family that is here, the rebirth, uh, the connection, the activeness, nobody left. I mean, we've been away, and one of the reasons that. I wasn't really coming live was uh, because, you know, all these platforms that we're using because of whatever, whatever. Um, but it was time for us to just pull back. Think about something. You know, most of the time it was about, all right, we, like we've given too much food for the children to chew and swallow. And so every day, like, like you you keep putting ugali in their mouth, in their mouth, in their mouth. They, they have a time where we, we pull back. And we do all the things we connect and just allow ourselves to actually digest, get back into us, reflect, get a space for us and think about and let the message, let the teachings sink into us. And when I see the spirit, 
that we have here on the Pan-African Daily and all other uh, uh, medias that are actually working for us, that Africans are really telling their own stories. I mean, conscious Africans, yes. And pulling us together at one, not just only because of economic gains or anything, but I'm talking about the basics of which you stand for, the value for which we stand for. We never left. Nobody ever left. The same community is here as active, even though they miss us. But I can imagine that the spirit that we have here is a rebirth of too much learning of all your theories, of all your teachings, and connecting to be here with us. It's just the practical aspect of what we're listening, isn't it? Like we listen to the lectures, but we're just doing the practical aspect of it. Connecting, typing, agreeing, um, mm -hmm. accepting to you. I mean, it's standing on the one principles of when we gather and we put uh, our, our stakes together in our words, in our spirit, everything just aligns with the thoughts that we send out to process and to bring exactly the results of what we want. True. Well, one of the things, if people could just imagine, imagine that all of you who are in the chapel and Susan and myself, and all of the billions of Africans around the world, imagine if we're just really one organism that's only imagining that we are separate pieces. Right? If you can imagine that, you begin to realize that we really are just one African organism. And the thing we're calling our personal consciousness is just aspects of that one organism. And if we can uh, write our personal consciousness, we will write the power of that great organism that we're all just a part of. Okay. Mm. You understand that, mm. right? Mm. Because that's yes. the way our yes. culture speaks of itself. When we talk about Ubuntu, that's what we're really talking about. But it's real, it's not theoretical. I can touch mm. Susan Tata. We've only met once. But Susan Tata, no, I can touch Susan Tata. Susan Tata can touch me, you know? We are the same organism, but we mm. must be at the same spiritual, ethical, and moral plateau in order to realize one another. Mm. You know, that's mm. too. That's when we have that unity level where we can rebirth ourselves from the knowledge we learn from one another. And each day is a rebirthing process to higher African consciousness. And don't be afraid of the mistakes we made in the past. Mistakes were just steps towards your own perfection. Correct. Rebirthing, mm. rebirthing, rebirthing. But we must know what we are rebirthing into, and that's where history and knowledge of ancestry comes in as being essential for the growth of a people to realize their freedom politically, economically, and culturally, never to forget that because we must on a daily basis assure that we can deliver food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security to the masses of our people so that they can deliver these things to themselves. But in order to mm. deliver food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security, they must get command of the economic politics and culture where they live. To do this, you must know the history of you and the place where you live in order to interpret what is the next step towards my freedom and the rebirthing of the African consciousness that will assure that freedom. Wonderful, wonderful because the few and what we have learned, what we have shared, what we have connected, I am very 100% sure that this has multiplied million folds in our community, in our neighborhood, in our families, among our friends, among our societies. There has been a change. I feel it, particularly this 2023. You know it when you are right together in harmony with one another, us as a people, when we agree on something, whether we meet, we don't meet, 
like one brother said here, you know, unity is a spirit, like you are saying, it is oneness. And when that oneness is full, it can only multiply. It means automatically the love, the, the fulfillment, the abundance in the spirit of connectivity as one people that I have in me cannot stay with me. You can see the brightness. You can see the contamination, how we contaminate each other. You can see when we meet that that spirit, that harmony, that 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 my art and, 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 and the king and the queen coming together to form one is stronger. Whether we like it or not, no amount of guns can break down this, 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 this unity. And I, I know, and I'm thanking because the few that we have here in this oneness, you can see the change and the impact in our communities. So that's just why when one, like you say, when one mind is healthy, is safe, a whole nation can be through the impact of our actions. And so I don't have any need to take out the negative energy, isn't it? I don't have any need to, 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 you know, to think otherwise. The thought process of the whole entire community that has been rebirthed, has been rejuvenated, that has been born, given into that essence of our unity. I'm quite, quite sure. Prof, I don't know how you feel, but I do know that the little thing we think is little that we've been doing here, connecting as a family, has touched, has shaken the whole universe. It has moved us. It has touched even things that we were not. Honestly, when I read it, it, it touched my feet in Tanzania, there were people that just knew my name, called me, of course, whether they're following us on the Pan-African or not. But I just believe that that one soul, that oneness that we have, it's multiplying in everything that we are, every environment that we are. We just lighten, we just illuminate, we just brighten the space, and we can never be the same again. And even our environment, even the world. No, the impact is too great. You're absolutely, absolutely right. Um, the time, you know, in indigenous African understanding of the divine is that it is the totality of everything, not something yes. that lives in the sky or something that lives in the earth or something that mm. lives something. Our notion of the divine, of God, is that it is the totality of everything, including us. We are part of the body of what God is itself. Anything short of that is something less than divine totality, supreme, omnipotent, omnipresent, um, you know, omnipotent and supreme. And so the our culture was telling us this all along, but somebody interrupted that. That interruption is called slavery. And for brothers and sisters on the continent, don't think those of us in the diaspora, we were the slaves and you were not. No, they enslaved the whole continent before they took the first one of us out of there, okay? And that war of slavery, we call it colonialism, neo-colonialism or slavery, whatever. Slavery is when someone take away your rights of self-determination. When someone take away your right to dream of tomorrow, when someone take away your right to choose who you will spend your the light of your life with in your partner, male or female, because only the male and female can perpetuate the divine. And so that's our culture. And for those who get that differently, I'm not knocking them. You get it differently. Let's see how it pans out. Let's see if you can create your world if you do not carry on creation. When I lay with my woman and I have intercourse with my woman, we create and we recreate ourselves. So when our bodies are gone, our creation is still there. We call them our children, our grandchildren. Those are our creation. The woman and the man, when they come together, they carry out the act of the divine itself to create human beings. 
We don't drop from the sky. So our culture taught us that then that relationship must have rules that's befitting the ethical moral partnership that it represents as the act of creation itself. It, it, it's our duty and our process. So when we study our culture, we want to say, oh, this one got some juju, or this one juju is better than this juju. We don't even know the word juju is a Portuguese word that means toy, you know? So juju is not even our word, you know? Um, so let's look and say, oh, oh one, have some sacred science knowledge of how to heal. And this one have some sacred science knowledge of how to help one have a baby when all the Western science say it is not possible. Because I remember two of my girls, or three of my girls, were told they could never have babies, right? That they would not have babies. I forgot the disorder they had where they would bleed uh, for two or three months, and then maybe not for two or three months, there's a word name for it. And then one day my mother came from Ghana, you know? Her name is Nana Fuasa. She's an ancestor now. She went to be an ancestor when she was 101. But she was my mother, my spirit mother, my blessing. And she came to the United States and she touched one of my children and touched all three of my children. And out of those three children who the medical doctors say could have no children, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven kids, grandkids. So there's, a, there's an understanding and a knowledge that's an African sacred science that we don't, we, we we're not paying attention to anymore. That how can she touch that little girl? And nine months later, a little girl comes. But here's what's so amazing. The little girl, my Mia, I call her Mia. She's the princess. When Mia starts speaking, what do you think the first thing she said to everyone when he said, where are you from, little girl? She said, I'm from Ghana. She still knew nothing about Ghana. She's just learning to talk. But she knows a spirit from Ghana put the light in her mama's womb so that she could carry out creation where the technology of Western science said it was not possible because she couldn't retain an egg. And the little girl says, I'm from Ghana. The little girl is now 13 and she will be traveling to Ghana for the first time physically with me this summer. Right? When I come into Ghana on the 24th of July, and we'll be there until about the 6th of August. So she can go home. Right? And I tell the brothers and sisters from the diaspora, when you go home, I call my tours, we've been doing it for 40 years, the African Pilgrimage Project. Because when we go home, we take the ancestors who died here, we take them back home with us. We take that, each of us create an energy cluster in this life cycle we're in. And when this body dies, the energy cluster stay with your nearest of kin. And when new babies come, the energy sometimes resume another life. But many of them would like to go back to the continent. So when we come back home, we bring them back, we, even unknowingly. But we bring them back home again, and they stay home then. They go home. So when we talk about African sacred science, we're not just playing with little words about religion. It's deeper than that. It's deeper than religion. You know it because you just went home. And you know when you went home, your ancestors gave you a bit of chastisement because you stayed too long. And you felt it. And you knew something different was going to be about you when you left Cameroon this time. Huh? Okay. True. And, 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 and you travel to the East, which is important because I think you're going to feature Tanzania in the conference in June in, in Germany, in the festival. So it's going to be mm -hmm. focused on Tanzania. So the spirit took you to Tanzania. And so we want to let the world see Tanzania and it's all of its African cultural beauty and variety in and, and, and Germany. Uh, in June, you know, and hopefully I will bump into some of you in Accra or Cape Coast or 
second D or Esocado or one of the places I'll be traveling around Ghana um, in July and August. But returning home in spirit, spirit is not a myth. Yesterday, I lost a cousin. She got sick with a stomach ache. She was a full lady. Um, on Saturday, on Sunday, her husband wanted to take her to the hospital, my cousin, um, but she didn't want to go. So she took on Monday, but she didn't make it. It's, she must have had a heart attack. And they were just at my house a month or so ago because my older brother, who was 86 years, was here from California. We were all celebrating. But the energy that is her could no longer live in an institution, a body, a house that had become too broken to maintain the ecology necessary for spiritual survival. Mm. Now I put that in the simplest terms, not religious, it's as simple as can be, so you can understand. As long as I keep this house healthy and nothing damages it, the spirit that is called James Small, Professor Small, can keep expanding and growing itself and expressing itself and living but when this house, and it will eventually deteriorate and get broken enough that it can no longer maintain the ecology necessary for me to reside, I will have to leave. We call the process death. But in the African sense, it's not death in the same way as death in the Western sense. Because I've always been here. The me that's speaking through this body has always been here. The body has not always been here. This is a new house, new temple. But the me that lives here have always been here, evolving, 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 rebirthing, rebirthing, rebirthing. So that at some point I can help you learn to rebirth, 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 so that we can help more of our people rebirth and our freedom will be ensured. And do not disconnect your spiritual reality from your food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security reality because they're not disconnected. They're not even distant. They're all in the mm. same package. And thus understanding mm -hmm. economic politics and culture is essential to ensure food, clothing, and shelter and safety because that's essential to maintain the house in which you live as a spirit. Mm -hmm. Come on, sister. That makes sense to you? But it, it, I mean, absolutely, Baba. I, how how can I disagree? How can I be indifferent? It's just as it, it's just PS to the mind and the soul, and it, it it's truth. What is truth? It's just the truth. Um, one one last before we round up uh, with the conversation today. I mean, you would you'll be going to uh, to Ghana on the trip on July. We we have to talk about that. Um, yeah. You tell us the itinerary. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of people that want to join you on that trip, and you've been doing it for more than 40 years. I mean, we are connected for the first time now, and a lot of people are getting to know us, but we are coming from a long, long background of the work that we have been doing in the yeah. background. So most of us is the same thing with uh, with my platforms. A lot of people see uh, uh, me on Pan African Daily, but I'm coming from very far. It's the same thing with you 40 years ago, 60 years ago, and most of us that are here mm -hmm. are carrying a whole back of history with us, the journeys oh, that we've been through, what we've been doing, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, one of the things that I always, my teacher, Dr. Professor Leonard Jeffries and his wife, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries, they introduced me to West Africa um, yes. 40 plus years ago. And we worked together as a team all these years, taking the tours. They're elders now and they can't travel. Dr. Jeffries is not well, but he's very strong now. He's back on his feet. He may even we want to be on the show soon. Um, yes. But those are the people who brought me into Africa, taught me how to do the tours and the trips. Um, and I must always make sure I give credit to Dr. Professor Leonard Jeffries and Dr. Rosalyn Jeffries. And we traveled That's together true. many, many, many years. And like I think I told you yesterday, I've been involved in organized political struggle for 60 years. Yes. Not 60 months, not 60 mm. days, 60 mm. years. 
And May mm. 19th is coming up. That's Malcolm X's birthday. And we've been mm. taking a pilgrimage, which I've been a part of, to his gravesite for 58 years. Mm. Every May 19th for 58 years at the mm. same time and the same place, performing the same African ceremonies for the ancestors. And we will be doing it this May 19th. We will leave from 125th Street in Harlem at 10 a.m. in the morning. And we will go to Ferncliff Cemetery where Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz is buried in one grave. And we will perform certain rituals um, for them and to celebrate them and tell them we love them and let the spirit that hovers over there know we will never ever forget you for the sacrifice you made on our behalf. Um, so people can know that struggle isn't something you do and then you go home at a certain age. You don't retire, mm. you die from this. Okay? Mm. You don't retire. You don't say, oh, mm. I'm married now. No, you find a different way to fight, but you keep fighting for freedom. You know? mm. Freedom truly is to be shackled to your identity. Ashe. We want our land back. We want our, the right to self-determination back. We want people who have been imprisoned falsely in Geneva to be released from those prisons. Who, how dare the colonialists would put our members in prison. If we have to judge them, let us judge them ourselves. You did not come at your world court. You didn't put yourself for one colonial crime one crime against humanity in your prison in Geneva, but you come and snatch our people. And so there are a lot of things we've got to fight about, yes. But always remember, food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security is essential to provide, to be provided by an understanding of economic politics and culture. And to do that well, mm. you must go and master your history. And you must mm. fully participate in your culture. Your culture isn't just dancing mm. and music. Each of the dance means something. Each of the note and mm. all of the musical treaties means something. What does this note mean? Besides it makes you feel like dancing. What is the message? Why does it make you feel like dancing? What cell in your body does it stimulate? And why does that music stimulate mm. you? Huh? What gene mm. did it wake up in you? And why did it wake up that gene? Really know who you are. Be the living African being that you are. You know? Hmm. So, hey. <laughs> we, there's we, too much, there's too much, there's too much love, too much love, too much love in this place. And you can actually feel, you know, uh, our elders, the, the, the doctors, uh, 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 Jeffries. And now you're going back uh, to, to rebirth or to remind us of the spirit of our ancestors. I also want to remind the community that we'll be commemorating and meeting here on that 19th of May, you know, to just remember to be in the same spirit with you while you're mm -hmm. out there doing it. We're also going to be here with you just thinking and just listening to some of the things, quotations and all the words and speeches even if we're just going to be typing them. So I'm calling on the community, please come out with a speech or a quotation or a word, whatever thing he did a lot, he said a lot, just come up on that day. We'll just be flicking them on this, we'll flung them on this on, on the screen and we meditate and we talk about it. We just think about it. And uh, yeah. it's just it's to be the guest. Yeah. And next year, Susan, we need to tell the whole African world, let's celebrate a Patrice Lumumba Day. Yes. Let's celebrate a Queen and Zinga Day. Let's find yes. other great ones who sacrificed so much to keep us in the space our ancestors wanted us in. Let's celebrate mm. them in every African community in the world. Yes. That, that's a power that you can't even imagine until you do it. Mm. 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 And when you see the power and the result of bringing all that energy together at one point, and then you'll see why they want to keep you from knowing yourself. You have to get mm. to know yourself. 
You have to yes. get to understand yourself. You have to learn how to be yourself. And when you do this, you can build and rebuild yourself. Because there's no reason why the best of the minds that make America work, you look in all the laboratories, you see, that, like Dr. Jeffries had open heart surgery and a valve replacement. The primary mm. physician was Nigerian at Hackensack University Medical Center. The secondary physician was Ghanaian. So all of our best minds is in somebody else's house. We need those minds back home. So if I get sick in, in Ghana, I can say, oh, the best Ghanaian doctor possible was in that hospital at Kolibu when I got there, or in the mm. hospital at Cape Coast Regional when I got there, or, or, mm. or, or Central Regional Hospital when I got there. Mm. But we can't do this unless we begin to self-determine. Mm. Self-determine, to determine that we're going to build Africa like we want to see Africa. But we can't do that mm. if we're not willing mm. to sacrifice. Mm. Yes, someone says That's a lot. That's a lot. Absolutely. Yes, I'm just showing the want, ideas that you're bringing. And, and I want to tell everyone here, one day, Winnie Mandela kissed me right here on these lips. And she says, All right. Oh, absolutely. She said, you are my revolutionary. I didn't wash my face for a week. <laughs> I wouldn't brush my teeth. I wouldn't wash my face. Because she kissed me right there. She was having a difficulty. And I and my brother stepped in to assure that she got out of the difficulty and took care of her security and got her safely back to the airport so that she could safely go home with the help of Minister Louis Farrakhan and his family. Mm. She was safely taken back home even when South mm. Africa was disrespecting her, you know? Mm. And so, oh my um, God. I mean, it's yeah, just. So I, I treasure yes. our great queen goddess and great king goddess, um, Winnie Mandela. And we need to have a Winnie Mandela then. That's what I was talking about earlier. We can create these sacred days based on the sacred spirits that came to help us and can have one for three, six, five. Maybe we only celebrate four or five of them open. But in our homes, every home, we can celebrate together. And if I'm celebrating Winnie on her birthday and you are and everyone else is, we will feel that spirit around the world mm. and, our, mm. and our children and our families. And mm. so the mm. power of self-love, that's the power of returning to revering ancestors. Ah, uh, yes, Brother Henry Sylvester Williams, one of our great Pan-Africanists who have brought us to this discussion that we are having around the world today about Pan-African and Brother Sankara, um, um, who was another one of a comrade that I got to be close to and ate dinner with him like less than a month before he was assassinated, um, me and Dr. Jeffries. Mm. Beautiful spirit, like one you will not know. Mm. But we can keep Sankara mm. alive with our self-determined struggle for pan-Africanism and unity of African people, because that's what he stood mm. for. That's what he did stood for. Um, oh, someone said the second Itakarati Ghana is my home. Oh, okay, Brother Kojo, I'm Kojo Mansa. So I will be in second D and in, in, in um, Takarati um, in July. But Nana Kwabana and Ketsia, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna visit the museum there also. So we will have a very, very good time. Um, if you reach out to the palace with Nana Kwame and Kessia and Esokado, he has all of my schedule there of when I'll be in, in Ghana. And of course, Mugabe is a king, one of our mm. great, great kings. And so this is how we teach our children of who they are. We teach them about the great kings and queens and warriors mm. and liberators and revolutionaries on a daily basis so that mm. they will know who mm. they are, know themselves. When they walk mm. out of our door, mm. no one can attack them with their miniature primitive cultures and so forth and religions, because our children will go in an armor of African self-determination based on the history and the understanding mm. of great African minds and bodies that have come to service them. And Magapule, who's our modern uh, God, who 
shined the light out of Tanzania and showed us how to stand up like men and women against even the Chinese foolish contracts. And they took him away from us as well. But for every Magafule they took, the ancestors have sent a hundred more. The same for Andrew mm -hmm. Young. For everyone, he's still alive, thank God, but his spirit will be in a hundred more. Because we don't die, we just, I'm gonna make a joke, we body shift. We jump from bodies to bodies. But the bodies mm. must have culture to mm. ensure its memory. See, when we shift, we have to rekindle mm. that memory. That's where culture comes in. Culture restores your memory of yourself before mm. this, you know. I hope I'm not going too high with this. I mean, it's just mm. <laughs> kind of like, um, and no, 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 no. That's that's just. I mean, I don't think it's even you. It's it's just the it's just the the ancestors and you and everything that we gather and we they bring it to us here is just what we need to know. Even the the aspect of us actually um, remembering them is them also reminding us we are here. So remind, mm -hmm. remember. And I, I don't think there's any coincidence in anything we say or do. They are just remembering us, and we, we as we mm -hmm. keep talking about them and and reconnecting and activating is like watering watering a plant all the time so i think even the names and everything that is just coming to us yeah. everything that is coming and i see oh, most of you in the chat writing it i don't know whether sister kalena Let's or brother ennis parker dr. Walter, or sister Shindra. dr walter rodney so for brother smith yes. we know that the government of guyana has now admitted their role but what wasn't said in that newspaper article was the American CIA and the Canadian intelligence network's role mm. with the then government and Guyana and the assassination of Brother Walter Rodney. But we knew it. Those mm. of us in the movement, we, we knew then. And we were calling it out then. So thank God now the, the world has been told he, he didn't die because he had some bomb that went off prematurely and the foolishness they were saying back then. Um, but Walter was a great hero who left us extraordinary literature uh, that we need to study. Anything that Walter Rodney wrote, even if it's one sentence, we need to study um, because his mind was so developed and so determined to bring us to self-determination. Mm. Uh, Muhammad Ali yeah. was just an extraordinary African. Even before he called himself Muhammad Ali, he was he was. Uh, a free African mind fighting for self-determination. Um, and the Nation of Islam gave mm. him a pathway in which to express that determination with the help of Malcolm X and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So we always praise Muhammad Ali for his greatness and his teachings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You see, I think one day we'll just go through this and you, you can even... I will, I will write the names and, and, and the ones that we remember so we can even just go through a short biography well, about many that and we do who, that production. There's so many whose name is not in the public light, who most of us will never know. Yes. So we do have to scrutinize all in the public light because even some in the public light yes. was was the enemy in disguise and we have to we don't have to call them out, let them rest in peace, but we will know who to hold up high and who to not hold up high. That's why you have Council of Elders. Mm. That's why you have societies of secrets. That's why you have the craft and the brotherhood. Mm. And let me make clear that the brotherhood and the sisterhood of Africa has never died. We still have our secret societies. We still have our rights of passage organizations. Our secrets are still held, mm -hmm. especially in Cameroon, because I know I was supposed to go to Cameroon when you was just a little girl. And um, it was your spiritual leaders that came to America and sought me out and asked me to come to Cameroon um, mm. to help with a mission. Um, a mission we couldn't carry out um, because it got pre prematurely. Um, some people got in the way of the mission. But I knew mm. Cameroon before I knew Susan in a more intimate way than I've ever told you. But one day we'll talk about that. <laughs> that that's, of course, oh, for sure, <laughs> sure. 
So I think we had said, this is not the first time that we're talking about remembering our ancestors here. Yeah, we didn't even, we did even mention what uh, Baba Leo Wright is saying and that we create a calendar. I think it's the right time now that all the ideas that we have, we're putting them now into a practical um, a step. So I, I would just call volunteers out there like Sister Kalena and uh, the others that are putting, we can put this calendar together. The first thing start celebrating the days is actually the calendar. Yeah, and, and so, so that people have be, their own calendars, you know, with all of these yeah. things in there. But we must create a continuity. We can't just do it in one year or just in one part of the country or Correct. one part of the world. It has to be universal to African peoples. Mm. And we can all share in the same yes. ideas, um, looking at the same great heroes and heroes. Mm -hmm. um, because this mm -hmm. is about determination. Okay. Um, this is about yes. freedom. The freedom fight is still on. The same fight that Patrice Lumumba was fighting in the Congo is still necessary to be fought uh, mm. in the Congo. Um, the same fight Kabila was fighting in the Congo before his assassination is still necessary to be fought in the Congo. Maybe not the same methodology, mm -hmm but we must be aware that this fight must uh, go on and mm -hmm. um we're fighting for our freedom we're mm. fighting to develop the self-determination so that we can educate the masses of our people to okay. understand why we must fight for freedom and and like mm. uh, uh desaline said it's freedom or death there is no in between mm. it's freedom or death Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have the Guyanas in the house saying hello yeah. to you, Osek Nateru, Gaya. Gaya. Hello to you, my dear, and Guyana. Um, yes. We also so, have our sister Stevie Robinson and saying knowledge is power. We all gather here. So, Baba, yeah. what do you want to round up with? Like we said, okay, 19, we all know we're going to gather here. But before you leave, I have a very important uh, announcement um, um, that the Kingdom of Embo uh, reached out to me this evening and asked me to share this. We're going to do, uh, if we don't start tomorrow, we're going to start on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And they have a whole three days a program about uh, reinstalling uh, the United Kingdom and Kingdoms of Africa. I think Brother Joshua said it a couple of times here. And now um, they, they they want to officially celebrate it. And so the uh, the King Bongane would be coming live and then with uh, some representatives to actually tell us the steps that they had put down and they'd be walking through remember all of us met is three years now or two years or one and a half year and the idea was to go behind take the idea the questions that were coming out of the diaspora put it into a package what we want and what we want to see and exactly the kingdom of embo sends great things you know to me i mean through the queen that i am from embo to say that they have put down all the thoughts and everything that we talked about, um, the diaspora coming back home, the issue of land, the issue of identity, the issue of names, the issue of, you know, a, a rebirth and stuff like that. So the Embo Kingdom took that, sit, sat down with, with the whole community and the other kings of the East and South, and, and, and they came out with a whole package. So they want to start to tell us about this package, how we can get involved and how it is necessary that everything that they said they have put it into action and this is really something that i love about us our work our engagement our call our journey is this aspect that we unanimously bring this suggestion to the table and our kings our queens and the community listen that's the first thing they listen and they don't only listen, they put the action plan behind it. So mm -hmm. starting from tomorrow, you hear from me if I announce it, or it's on Monday, uh, or it's on uh, a Friday, but they will continue a series to talk about uh, the, uh, the returnees 
and what they, you should expect when you're coming back uh, to, uh, to the continent and which kingdom you want to relocate to or what are the, the modalities or how to look the things sat together and they brought out both step and the way forward. So I'm really inviting all of you pay attention to the 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 press release that I'll be sending out or who is coming and when are they coming so that we don't miss this event is very important when King Bongane is coming up and uh, uh, in the company of uh, King Joshua Maponga and also some of the elders of the community would be coming to give us a clear way forward depending on the stuff that we'll be talking about. So that's very big news that I wanted to share with you before uh, Prof rounds up. And um, yeah. Well, that, that is very good news. Um, oh, yes, I did get a memo with a hundred kingdoms that have been uh, delineated. Um, so the, the quest mm -hmm. was real Pan-Africanism is a slow walk. Um, because we're not trying to implicate or duplicate European processes at all. We want to go back to our ancestral mm. instructions. And this is what I'll say to everyone mm. that must be kept completely at heart, that we are to be instructed and informed by our ancestors and our ancestors alone in terms of core establishment. And then yes, we borrow mm -hmm. from any everything in the world that is useful to us, and we discard those things that are no longer useful to us. So I'll be looking forward mm -hmm. to to that. And in terms of rounding up, is about an Africanism or perish, because the enemy is very clear about who they are and what they want. We have to be very clear about who we are and what we want. And we want the unification of African people to establish mm. on earth an Africanism that's based on African ancestral principles, concepts, and ideas that is rooted mm. in their knowledge of cosmology, ecology, and the human interaction therein. And we cannot go wrong that way. So mm. it's like I said, it's freedom or death. An Africanism or perish. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And our brother Edward just said the press release or the conversations has to re really focus about re the relocating process for the diaspora. Yes, that's all it's going to be about. Yeah. Um, that. So yeah, one comment we have made it today. Um, I would like to just intend. Sorry. No, that's I just like one. to show up this flyer again about our meeting yes. about our meeting in Germany. You have been seeing us post this flyer on our Facebook page, on our status and stuff. What I want to call on all of us is to kindly post this flyer on your Facebook and Instagram and social network. You must not be there physically, but you just sharing and connecting with one another it's a very great essence. We have a copy of them. Whether you see this one is the latest one. These are the banners with everything that it takes. We're just three weeks to go. And there are a lot of people actually sharing out. Um, all you need to do is just post it on your status at least once a week until we get to it. Those of you who have relatives and contacts in Europe and particularly in Germany, please make sure you share it with them and invite them. So even if we are not present physically, we can engage our neighbors, our contacts in Europe to actually be there. So we are representing each other in every community and all the th things that we do and wherever we are going to. It's very important for us to know. So this one is it, but if you see this one is still the same. We had been sharing this one here. All is still the same of our event or the event flyer. So we do different, different, different types of communication. So I'm calling on the community to just be active enough, be a part of this, 
click it, call your people in Europe, call the ones in Germany, your relatives out here. We know a lot of African-Americans who came in the barracks and they work with the military. A lot of them are the one actually supporting and most of them that are conscious also. So like we say, building that force, each one call in one like the like the basket of 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 i don't know uh, that our sister talked about the caribbean one seat putting in so even if you are not there you're going to share it to people who would love to be there and then another thing that i had as a question from uh, uh shock matthews i mean he was asking um what does it take for people that like them the media and also people that are calling on the african unity who cannot be there um how can they participate or contribute you know even financially so i said we'll come up with that our sister kalia baker you met her she just opted and said dr Sus, uh, to, uh, Sus, uh, tata send me the project with the sponsorship or uh, private support i would share it to the whole african-american caribbean communities and all our people so sister kalia would be reaching out to you she's already made a lot of lists i'm not talking only about you professor james Ma. i mean all of us that we are coming to this platform and she'll be sharing that information if uh, in anyhow that we have to connect and to support but either by calling our people to be there or in any form that we wish is necessary. A unity, a collection, a pl platform is better and we must do it all the time. So thank you so very much, Baba. Thank you all our listeners and viewers. I mean, we you did it again. And I know if we will continue, you're going to hit three hours. It's always been that. But we would like to have a special show again with you when you come to tell us about the trip to Ghana. And I think that will be very important. I will give you the date for it. Or do you want to already say it here? Could we do that no, on you, Sunday? You, you determine when, and then we'll come together and do it. And I'll probably okay. do a slide presentation on Ghana that I put together. Yes. That time. That's going to be awesome. We cannot wait to just have that. And I want to do it even before the meeting in Germany. I know yesterday you were telling me, no, Dr. Tata, just focus on the meeting in Germany and then we'll do that. No, I would like to do that as soon as possible because we want people to register. And an information stand would also be available at the Expo, Pan-African Expo in Germany um, with actually how people can connect and even book that trip to be with us in Ghana. And I'm very thankful that the Pan-African Daily is going to be a part of this to cover that uh, that process so that we can really open up a lot of um, room for our people. Okay? Are we good? Okay, have, yes, ma'am. And to all of the brothers and sisters who are participating around the world, love you much. Peace and blessings. Peace and blessings to all of us, and we see us again. So I thank you also. He just left, but I think all of us should be leaving at the same time as well. Thank you to all our new members and to all those who have been away for one reason or the other, whatever has been keeping you back. And I thank you for your resilience and for keeping, uh, um, uh, I mean, for staying constant on the, on the journey, um, whether it's through your families, through your relatives, through your communities, through your neighbors, I just want to appreciate you. I want to say we appreciate you so much. We love us so much. And the more we spread this love, this energy among us, whether we're meeting at our platforms or we are sharing communication, there is nothing that is a legacy that we can leave for our people or sharing solidarity with one another. So I, I love to see you again tomorrow, okay? And so that we take that journey to the next step. If um, at King Embo, the Embo Kingdom is not ready tomorrow, I would bring a young, vibrant author that was recommended to me by Baba James and also Baba Marvin. He's called Eyo. Most of you have read his incredible works. And I've been called since six months to bring him on the show. He was not reachable. He was just busy doing stuff. But we finally connected and we're charting. So in case um, the Kingdom of Embo is not ready tomorrow, they want to start on Thursday, I'll be bringing Brother Eyo on this conversation tomorrow for us to get to know him because he has just joined our lineage of
professors and mentors and voices on the Pan-African Daily. So I thank you so very much. And if, in case of any question, please drop it on our WhatsApp line. You have it there. Or you want to get more information on the, on the event going on in Germany and other issues, please do not hesitate to send us an email at panafricandailytv at gmail.com or you just WhatsApp up on plus four nine one five seven eight two one one two three seven nine. And do not forget to support us, whether it's through Cash App or through PayPal or through, like I said, we are one and indivisible. Thank you so very much. We see us again tomorrow, same time. Peace and blessings and love to all of us. Did I miss a point? No. Did I say I love you so much? Yes, I just did. So good night. Bye. You are watching the Pan-African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want. Unity. Consciousness. Our culture. Our spirituality. Our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling it. After centuries of misguidance caused by slavery, colonization, lack of awareness of our history, and institutional disinformation, a new Africa is on the move, determined and getting organized. Africa to Kupamuja. Welcome to the United Kingdoms of Great Africa. The United Kingdoms of Great Africa is the cradle of the alliance movement of all African intelligences around a common ideal. The unity and development of a strong, concurring, and completely de-dogmatized Africa through the channel of a strong organization called The Africa We Want Global. You are an African, Afro-descendant, researcher, historian, scientist, or simply an NGO. You want to be part of this great historical march towards the total freedom of an uninhibited Africa? Visit our website, www.africawewantglobal.org. Register and discover the range of our platforms for change. Africawewantglobal.org. Join the kingdom, be part of it. An initiative of Dr. Susan Tata.